Okay, so hello, I'm Amy. Um, thank you to Alex for inviting me. Um, thank you to my baby for not popping out early so that I could come today. Um, so I'm a designer, maker and researcher, um, uh, specialising in knitwear and I work under the umbrella of my label, Keep and Share, and I'm also a researcher at the University of Leeds. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, my knitting practice and the role of numbers within that, really. Um, so yeah, maths and number patterns in my knitting practice, uh, and so that relates to me creating fabrics and garments, and also um, I'll talk about a specific uh, challenge that I addressed in my PhD research that was about changing gauge in knitwear, which I'll try and explain in terms that make sense to other people and to me. That's the challenge. Um, it's quite nice to have the opportunity to talk about numbers and maths. Um, and as I was putting this presentation together yesterday, I have to say I was working on a just-in-time principle, because I didn't want to make a wasted <laughs> presentation. Um, I realised that if you asked me what my practice is about, I would normally say that it was about um, emotions and conversations and relationships between people. I wouldn't usually say that it was about numbers and maths and patterns and things like that. But the two things are totally both there. I think it's just... I tend not to find people who are interested in listening to the numbers bit. Um, and so this is um, my knitting circle, which I take to um, music festivals in the summer, uh, where people sit and knit, and all the tags are little fragments of stories that people leave after they've sat and knitted for a while. And so in that context, I would say that the thing I'm mainly interested in is really the stories and the connections between people that happen as they're knitting. But having said that, Knitting is an inherently countable thing. Um, it's not a, a sheet sort of analogue um, material. It's, it's something that you can count. You've got building blocks. Um, and so because you've got these things that you can count, the maths is inherently sort of there within what you're doing. So I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about the maths involved in... Uh, me creating items of knitwear. So I started my label in 2004. Uh, between 2004 and about 2010, I made 12 collections of knitwear, um, which have added up to this archive that's on my website of over 150 items. Um, so that's a lot of calculating and figuring out um, of like how many stitches, how many rows, how many decreases, what tension, all of these kind of number things. Um, <coughs> okay, so this is my trusty, well, one of my trusty Knitmaster knitting machines, which most of the garments on the previous slide have been made on. Um, and you've straight away got things that you can, you can count and that you have to count. So... Uh, the star there is showing needles on the machine and how many needles you use affects how wide your piece of knitting is. You only have a limited number of needles, there's 110 needles on this machine. If I want something wider than that, I have to start being clever and thinking how I'm going to join pieces together. Tucked away behind there is the row counter, so that's helping me to keep track, hopefully, if I remember to set things up correctly how many rows I'm doing. So numbers of stitches, number of rows, that's quite straightforward. This little monkey here on the carriage um, is the tension dial. So as I turn that, um, it alters the position of some um, cams underneath the carriage and that affects how much the uh, needle pulls the yarn through uh, the previous loop as it forms a stitch and therefore how big the stitch is and so it goes from 0 to 10 uh, not being smaller stitches 10 being bigger stitches and there's two clicks in between uh, each main number and so I would write in my notes tension 4.2 and that's not quite as exact as you would think it is because different 
different machines, like the same machine, but I've got eight of these, the same one, will knit up slightly differently, and different yarns will knit up slightly differently. Different dye lots of, different, of the same yarn will knit up differently. And so I'll spend time knitting them, be like, oh, should I go down a click? And spend a long time worrying about how many clicks up and down I should go. And then there's a punch card, um, which is a means of patterning. And so the, the holes or the solids on the card pass onto these pegs here, which are then transferred to cams in the back of this carriage, which then transfer to cams in the bottom of the carriage. And they affect where these needles go as the carriage goes across. And that affects the um, structure of the fabric that's knitted. Uh, and that is very... The, the, the patterns and the, the uh, um, repeats within that are very important. <coughs> so I'll stuck this in, which is um, a little diagram that I made when I used to run a workshop for amateur knitters on calculating your own patterns. I found that lots of people, lots of people enjoy following kind of commercial set patterns, but Sometimes people feel kind of hemmed in by them. They can't find um, the, a, a pattern for something they want to make. Um, someone also once just said, I just want to knit off-piste. Um, so I'd get people coming that wanted to knit off-piste. Um, someone else just said, I, don't, I just don't like being bossed about, um, which I quite liked. So it's kind of making your own pattern is uh, a way of breaking out a little bit um, as a knitter. And so this was my sort of trying to uh, guide people through the process of how they might uh, go about doing this. And so the two bits that you need is you need to know what shape of thing you're trying to knit. Um, and although garments look curved, knitted garments look curved, they're always straight lines. Um, and so any shape that you want to knit, I would break down into rectangles and triangles. And then you need to know what you're trying to knit that with, so what fabric. Um, and for the fabric that you're trying to knit, I always call these the magic numbers um, of how many rows per centimetre and how many stitches per centimetre. And so you've got those two elements, and they come together into kind of calculating the pattern, converting it into some instructions. And I suppose the important bit here is that I found myself talking a lot about maths logic and knitting logic. So there are computer programs you can use which will, you can put in a shape and you can tell it the, the gauge of your fabric, so how many rows and stitches per centimetre, and it'll give you this kind of perfect looking uh, diagram of what you should knit, but it's often awful to knit because the computer program only knows maths logic. It doesn't have the tacit knowledge that a knitter has, and so Actually, the calculation bit isn't that complicated. So when I was teaching this workshop, I would be encouraging knitters to use their knowledge of going, oh, decreasing once every three rows, that's not going to be very, oh, oh, I don't like that. I'm sort of using that knowledge to apply and doing what I would always, in a very formal sense, call jiggery-pokery, of um, doing jiggery-pokery with your, your numbers that come out of the calculation to make it into something that's nice to knit. So I think that comes out in the rest of the things I'm going to say is I'm always trying to balance up maths logic and knitting logic and not just blindly following the numbers that you might kind of calculate. Um, so one element of this is if you want a patterned fabric is using the punch card, which is this really <coughs> elegant, um, I think, uh, means of programming. It's binary, you've got a hole or you haven't got a hole. Um, and on the machine that I like to use, it has a 12 stitch punch card. So your repeat can only be 12 stitches wide or it could be something within that. So it could be two, three, four, six stitches wide and it would be repeated across the, across the card. The cards are usually 60, 60 rows long. And so it has to be something that, a pattern that divides into that. You can see on this one that I've shortened it, uh, so that would end up being uh, like 48 rows long. So you can shorten it and work with the multiples within that, so the repeat within this is probably 24 rows. Um, 
And so, like 12 and a, 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 a normal machine, so that's a chunky machine that I use, a normal machine has a 24 stitch punch card. That's even more divisible. It's like, oh, 24, what a beautiful number that, that has all of these um, factors within it that you can divide into. I've got another machine that falls between the two, which has an 18 stitch punch card, which is rubbish. And there's no wonder that that machine went out of production very quickly because <laughs> you just can't fit that much into an 18 stitch punch card. It's really frustrating. Um, and so you might dream up a pattern that you want to knit, but it needs to divide into those uh, multiples. And then as you're placing that pattern onto a garment, you need to think where you want it to fall. Um, so because this is quite a big repeat, it really mattered kind of that really affected the, the width of the garment because I wanted my diamonds to match up neatly at the sides <coughs> as well. And the other thing to say about punch cards is when I first started, it was like a mystery that I would take a punch card and be like, I don't know how this is going to turn out. And I would just try and knit it and see what happened. And then the more I worked with them, the more I realized that I could see, I could read the punch card and know what it would do without knitting it. Um, yeah, and so it was kind of that, like, the more I worked with it, the more the knowledge kind of uh, seeped into my brain. Okay, so this is another um, example of the, the calculating. So there's the punch card bit. There's also the thinking about making the shape of the garment. So this is the rectangles and triangles thing. Um, I photographed one of the less bonkers ones of my pages and notebooks. Um, quite often they're all written from all different directions. Um, so I have the notes for everything I've ever, ever designed. Um, sometimes if I go back to try and make one, I have to sort of try and step into what I was thinking at the time that I was doing it, like 10 years ago or whatever. Um, and so I'll be thinking about uh, the shape that I need to make and if I need to decrease to make this triangle. Sometimes the rates of decrease will be different at one side from the other. Um, and you have to really get into the rhythm if you're decreasing once every row on this side or once every two rows on this side. It's, all, it's almost like a dance. Oh, that's good. Um, or every two rows and every six rows. And you have to really like keep the multiples going in your head as you're going along. Um, so that's all the kind of number, uh, implicit number stuff in that designing and making all of those garments. After quite a lot of years of doing this kind of thing, um, I started to want to make a different kind of work uh, that was more exploratory, less commercial, more exploratory, and more like things for exhibition, uh, I suppose. Um, and that involved a technique that I developed called stitch hacking, which I call stitch hacking, uh, which is about taking an existing piece of knitwear, opening up the fabric, and starting to ladder down each column of stitches. Because that's the magical thing about knitting, is that you can mess with it after it's been made. And so in this, I'm teach, te treating each stitch as a, like a little unit of possibility that I can mess with and I can reconfigure. So this was a plain piece of plain knitting um, and I opened it up and laddered down and reformed these stitches and so I suppose that's kind of a kind of yeah it's, it's a, a kind of hacking seeing these stitches as something that could be messed with um, and the counting within this becomes very important because as I'm laddering from here all the way down this column to here I have to then know how many stitches three from the back two from the front, five from the back, five from the front, three. And if you get out by one, it's really annoying. <laughs> and if you're a perfectionist, you have to go back and fix it. Um, that went on to a different level with this. So this was a found cardigan. Um, I hacked this bit, so I hacked in my name and the date. So previously, this section of the cardigan was just the same as that. And so I wanted to see if I could reconfigure these stitches. But because it had already been knitted, there was a certain amount of blue yarn and a certain amount of white yarn within each row. So this bit is me working out how many units of each colour there were in each row. 
and then this is me trying to work out how I could use up the same number of units to write the thing that I wanted to write um, while it, well, keeping it legible. And I think, I think I w it worked out. Um, it's one of those crazy things that you do and then you step back and think, I don't quite know how I did that. Um, okay, so that. Uh, okay, so the stitch hacking was the, the start of something really, um, where I started thinking about how I could use my design and making practice to um, think about ways of reworking existing garments rather than always making new ones. And so that research developed into this diagram where you start off with any item of knitwear at the top and then this represents technically every technical thing that you could do to an existing item of knitwear. Obviously each one has countless aesthetic variations um, but in principle how you could open up and mess with those stitches and the steps that are involved in them. I'll test you on this later. Um, and so a, bit, a, a thing that emerged in doing that was, um, well for one thing, I wanted it to apply to all of the knitwear in our wardrobes, not just kind of hand-knitted things. And so we wear a lot of finer gauge, mass-produced kind of um, industrially produced knitwear now. Um, which is too <coughs> fine for any sane person to want to hand knit. Um, and so in order to do that, you need to move from these teeny tiny stitches produced by quite a fine gauge knitting machine to some junkier ones that um, a sane person would knit. And the principal time when you would be doing that is if you were replacing a section of knitwear. So this just represents the process that I'm on about. And you would particularly want to do that if you had raggedy cuffs. So you could like chop off the cuff bit of your, the, of your sleeve, re-knit that section, pick up the stitches and re-knit that section. And so that's reasonably straightforward if your new stitches are the same gauge as your old stitches. It's less straightforward if you're working from fine stitches and you want to go to chunkier ones. Because Thod's Law decrees that it won't be anything as straightforward as like two of these going into one of these. It'll be something a bit more awkward. Um, so what I realised was I needed to figure out how what this relationship was between new and old. So if you divide your new stitches per 10 centimetres by old stitches per 10 centimetres, <coughs> you get a multiplier. For example, 30 divided by 40 gives you 0.75. And your way of getting from these fine stitches to chunky stitches, because you need basically to have less of them, is to decrease. So you can put two together, or you can put three together. And these are my um, graphic representations of that. And so I was thinking about then, well, if I've got any, I wanted to be able to go from any old fabric to any new fabric. And so you would... Uh, work out your multiplier and look for the nearest ratio and I put in all ratios uh, from 3 to 1 up to 10 to 9 the biggest factor was allowed to be 10 and then I thought about how those um, ratios would lay out in terms of um, numbers and what, what you would have to knit together so these are when you're putting 2 together and these are when you're putting 3 together and this is when you're putting 3 and 2 together so this was like every variation. But when I started to do them, I realised that loads of them were not nice to knit at all. So that's where the knitting logic and the maths logic comes back. And so then that kind of simplified to... I edited the selection to uh, ratios which were nice to knit. And I did this partly by working with some knitters and we would just start doing it and go, this is rubbish. <laughs> And there's one quote from a knitter in my research who said, I mean, you've done it, but is it worth having? <laughs> <laughs> Which, when you get a bit obsessed with the patterns, you're like, oh, this is a really good one, and then it ends up looking rubbish, and that, that's no good in knitting logic terms. And then the really nice thing that I realised was that these ratios start to create their own patterns. So you can just knit from one to the next, and they just kind of join on uh, 
in a reasonably boring way, but you can actually exploit the decreases to create their own inherent patterns. So this one I call rabbit ears. Um, this is the thing, I was suddenly creating all these new patterns, but I've never seen anyone doing this in a knitting book because maybe no one ever had any need to in the past. So I had to think of names for all of these patterns. Um, and then you've got a problem when you try to write the instructions because the, the, it depends what ratio you're knitting. So I gave two examples there. And then this was another pattern that emerged from the decreasing, which emerged from the change in gauge. So then I used those, um, that idea and that idea of changing gauge on this sample garment, which had five sample um, treatments, re-knitting treatments. And so the one that relates to what I've just been talking about is here, where I've re-knitted the cuff. And so I've gone from teeny tiny stitches, which were like 60 stitches in 10 centimetres, something like that, to about 28 stitches in 10 centimetres, something like that. Um, and had to work out a way of doing that that would keep it nice and flat and actually a, a pattern sort of emerged from that process. The same principle was used uh, in adding the embellishment there, in doing the pocket and in cardiganizing, a very popular treatment. Um, you would prefer your jumper to be a cardigan. Um, picking up stitches and knitting off this way, the, the, the idea works in exactly the same way. So that was a little whistle-stop tour of some numbers and some knitting um, and the inside of my head. Um, that's all. Thank you. <laughs>